Forests affected by beetle kill are still a very predominant issue in Colorado. This state has had two epidemics in the past 20 years and continues to find solutions to this battle confronting their forests. We learn from the forest products industry and the Forest Service about what beetle kill is and how to spot it. So it's really easy to tell if trees have bark beetles in them. Um, the first indicator is that you'll see them fading. So that means that instead of being green, they, um, depending on the tree, but they typically turn red. And um, that's when you know that they're full of beetles is when they're like turning that red color. Once they're kind of more of a straw color, that means that that tree died last year and those beetles are now gone from that tree, typically, or it just doesn't have any needles anymore. Um, so that's one indicator. The other indicator um, with like ponderosa pine or lodgepole pine, um, you get pitch tubes and that's the tree's natural response to get rid of the bark beetles. So the bark beetle bores in and resin will then flow out and try to pitch out those bark beetles. And when it's a really good water year, it's not droughty, the trees have a much better chance of being able to win or pitch out those beetles. Our forests, they're hurting. I will definitely say that, um, you know, spruce beetle is pretty much ravaging all of our high elevation timber. The spruce fir forest is, you know, anywhere you look, you got spruce beetle. Um, but as you go down, there's a bunch of problems with dwarf mistletoe, all these insects and disease that are affecting it. And one big thing with this stand of trees, our forest type is it's overstocked, it's overgrown. It's not back, you know, the natural regime. If you look at this pinion forest around here, if you look 100 years ago, there would be half as many trees here. So Colorado has actually been impacted heavily by both the mountain pine beetle and the spruce beetle. So in this area, we have predominantly more spruce, and so we've been impacted by the spruce beetle. And southern Colorado has primarily been impacted by the spruce beetle. It has decimated certain national forests. So for example, the Rio Grande National Forest is about 98% spruce. And of that, they've had over 90% mortality of their spruce. So if you drive from here down to Pagosa Springs and over Wolf Creek Pass, you'll see nothing but standing dead. Basically everything north of I-70 in the lodgepole pine and just just wiped it out. It was just, they, it was amazing. It was a ultimate pandemic. So the Forest Service quickly switched to trying to salvage that timber versus cutting green spruce at the time. Getting at the question of, is there a way we can mitigate it or stop it before it happens? When it's at an epidemic level like we had with the mountain pine beetle from 97 to 2012 that really hit Summit County and um, Grand County, it hit 3.4 million acres. You know, it was the lack of fire, the lack of cutting, you know, temperatures warming up, all of that, it was all building. We would have to be treating 50, 60 years ago to really combat it. Once it started, our forests were overgrown. The denser trees are, the easier bark beetles are gonna move through it. We also knew that uh, we wanted to try to keep that bark beetle population at that endemic level or that natural level as opposed to that broad scale outbreak or epidemic level that we saw impact in uh, lodgepole forests across the state of Colorado as well as you know Wyoming and Montana and New Mexico really across the whole Intermountain West we've seen huge um, mort mass mortality events associated with mountain pine beetle infestation in those lodgepole forests that hadn't experienced a substantial amount of um, fire or, or active management or, or other disturbances. Now we hear from experts about how these beetle epidemics have created their own carbon footprint problem, how the remaining dead stands can cause extremely dangerous and destructive fires in the forests surrounding Montrose and beyond, and how the forest products industry has adapted to solve these problems. Recognizing that we needed to manage some of those fuels to prevent catastrophic wildfire, the industry has been very, very involved with trying to harvest as much of the beetle kill as possible for a couple of reasons. One, um, to secure the economic value of that material. 
two, to reduce the, the fuel loading, and three, to also make sure that when it starts to decompose, it doesn't, or when it starts to fall, it's not adding to that fuel loading. An added benefit to harvesting a lot of that dead material is we are permanently locking up carbon and not letting it just naturally decompose and be released into the atmosphere. About the time that that shelf life of that tree got to the point where it wasn't uh, salvageable, and that's when the spruce beetle took off. And so we had about a 10 year period of lodgepole pine dying that this mill was running. And then about the last 10 years of, has been dead spruce. So yeah, it was a two decade at least period <clears throat> where there really wasn't much green timber being harvested in the state. It was all focused on dead salvage. Getting into wood products and working with the industry, you know, it's tough here because our wood products that we have here are nothing like you have in the Northwest in big timber trees. They grow slow here, they're not straight here, um, but that means we got to get creative. You know, it's not always going to be your saw logs or your hot house logs, you know, 16 foot logs going out that are 30 inches in diameter, you know, stuff from biochar. Um, you know, using small utilization of wood is, you know, something we're not there yet. We don't have the capacity in the way of, you know, those plants or whatever here that we could bring that wood to. We have small sawmills here. They're great. You know, one is Wilkins Lumber. They're fifth generation loggers and owning that mill. And I give them credit every day because it's not an easy job to run a mill in Colorado these days. And like the industry had to evolve too because it changed the way we did harvesting. It also changed the way we did milling. There was safety precautions that come in when you are only harvesting dead. Um, several, several of our mills had to add um, a different like air quality system within their mills just to protect workers. Just when you're harvesting nothing but dead, there's a lot more sawdust and fine dust that's um, both a fire hazard and a, a safety hazard for workers. So, and of course that doesn't necessarily happen overnight um, as much as we wanted it to, but we definitely geared up. Um, we went, for the Rio Grande went from a green program to a dead program fairly quickly, and that's all we did for a while on the Rio Grande was harvest dead. Down in the, on the Rio Grande and part of the San Juan, we had the West Fork Complex. And this was the first large catastrophic fire we saw in Beetle Kill. And it really changed the thought process of a lot of people. Uh, these are high elevation spruce forests that normally have snow until late June. Yet it was burning in June and July of that year. And so it really got people thinking that what didn't used to be possible is now very possible. You know, when you see catastrophic fires like uh, Burned Up Paradise, California, you know, with a loss of life like that, or even our fires last year um, that burned around Granby and darn near hit, got to Boulder, you know, your perspectives change a little bit when you got a wall of fire coming at you. And <clears throat> I, I think that certainly in Colorado, there's a different, there's a mindset now that we need to get we need to do some management. We have to just not let this ever happen again um, to the extent that it did. Uh, the Forest Service is very much reacting to it, trying every tool that they have, trying stewardship contracts, timber sale contracts, good neighbor authority contracts, you know, any way that they can to get more timber harvesting done, you know, more salvage harvesting done. What we've also discovered is we can't do this on our own. This is not a Forest Service problem. This is a, a um, this is an ecosystem problem, and the, the ecosystem on our forests don't know boundaries. And so um, we have to involve local communities, um, our friends at the state, private landowners, uh, as well as our, our partner agencies across um, you know the federal government to leverage all of our expertise and all of our tools to address this problem together. And again, that's that. That's the elemental um, foundation of this concept of shared stewardship. And I gotta say, like as an agency, there's a little bit of letting go and integrating people and in ways into our work that perhaps we weren't known for, you know, uh, throughout a huge portion of our history, where our focus is, perhaps was a little bit more narrow around uh, some of our core mission, which is a reliable flow of water and timber for the American people. We've, we've acknowledged through um, our 
the growth in our multiple use mission, everything from active timber harvest to wilderness preservation, that um, there's a variety of outputs that we need to conserve and, and manage for. And with that comes some inherent, what I call beautiful tension. So the National Wild Turkey Federation mission is to protect habitat for wild turkeys, but all species of wildlife. And the one thing that the Wild Turkey Federation realizes is that we can't do that alone. We need the U.S. Forest Service and you need the industry because if you don't have industry, you can't afford to do forest restoration. And the bottom line is all wildlife needs a healthy forest. We, we have a lot of work in the way of thinning and doing good forest restoration to get back to those natural regimes of these forest types from pinyon and juniper all the way up to spruce fir. I think these collaboratives really took off after all this happened. Um, you just see this, this, this effort of everybody asking a question, how do, we, how do we keep this from happening again? And you're getting it from all different perspectives now. So yeah, it has changed in Colorado. I think it's changing nationally. You, know, you look at the, the amount of money the United States government spends on forest firefighting annually, and it's appalling. With the two-decade beetle epidemic coming to an end, Colorado is working hard to push for collaboratives to make a change together. The state knows now that working with forest product industries is a vital key to forest health. And these fellow industries know that working collectively is the only way forward. Show your support for We the Forest. Share this video or buy gear at wetheforest.com.